Well, hello, Grace Bible Church. It's good to be with you today. Today is Wednesday, July 29th, 2020, and it is the 20th week of us sheltering in place here in Contra Costa County. It's also the 20th pastor cast, and so I thought it'd be appropriate for us to hear from two of our pastors today. I've got with me Pastor Scott Denny. Hello, everyone. And I've also got Pastor Tony Sinelli. Hello, everybody. What you're probably going to notice coming up is the quality of video is going to change. No, your TV is not going bonkers. No, YouTube is not scaling us back or doing anything to persecute us. Really what it is is we're conducting this conversation via Zoom. And what that's going to do is allows us to conduct this via social distancing protocols because we always want to follow the rules. And on top of that, it allows us to uh, host an interview that you'll be seeing towards the end of this pastor cast. So right off the bat, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get us up to date with a number of our missionary partners. And so, Tony, uh, what do you hear from around the world? Thanks, Ben. Well, I've, most recently I've spoken with uh, the mission partners we have in Mexico. I spoke to Fernando and Silvia in Tijuana. Uh, at this point, uh, she's still up and down with uh, her epilepsy. You know, she was recently diagnosed with that. So she's not 100%. Uh, uh, thankfully, that church does have another elder, Bruce Moscoso, and so he's pitching in, doing some of the teaching on video uh, with his, um, his role there that he shares with uh, Fernando. Fernando is taking care of Sylvia and also you know, visiting by calling and uh, spending time on Zoom conference calls with some of the, the church members. So that's what's going on there in Tijuana. Uh, they're still pretty much tied down uh, heavily and the people are concerned about coming there. As you know, I mean, Fernando lost four family members, so he can personally share the reality of that. Uh, I also spoke with uh, Pablo in uh, San Quintin. Uh, most of you know he's about five hours south in Baja. And Pablo is not doing too well physically right now. He needs to get to a doctor. Uh, he's starting to retain some water, he says. He's worried about his kidneys. Uh, two of the church members lost their fathers to COVID-19. The fathers weren't church members, but they are very close to them. So the church is kind of feeling that, kind of reeling from that and uh, mm. concerned about that. I don't have any other recent updates from the, any of the other mission partners in other parts of the world. It's all been pretty much the same. So I concentrated on Mexico recently. Thanks, Tony, for those updates. We definitely want to keep them in prayer. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to shift over to Scott as he gives us an update about what's going on in our local body. Thanks, Ben. Well, here locally, um, just a few things for you as it connect, connects to the church's finances. Our giving through the month of July, and we can rejoice in this, and that this time last year, we're ahead of pace from where we were this time last year and a lot of all that's been going on uh, in our community and, and locally. Uh, we can rejoice in that. Um, People have been faithfully continuing to give. We find ourselves a little bit behind in July, but that's pretty common uh, for us in terms of our patterns of giving. So we nevertheless remain uh, hopeful and prayerful and rejoice in what the Lord has done for us up to this point through uh, the generosity of the saints and giving to the ministry of the church. The Benevolent Fund uh, remains uh, very well cared for by the kindness of people. I believe the deacons have had opportunity to use have, have had occasion to use it to care for some within the flock um, as some have lost jobs and lost income. So again, we're grateful, grateful for the kindness of the saints and giving to the Benevolent Fund. And with our Hispanic ministry, it continues to thrive during this time. Um, their, their online services are well watched. And when they had services in person for that brief moment, they were well attended. So we can rejoice in just what the Lord has done with this Hispanic ministry through Ray's uh, leadership and care and love for the flock and just how the saints continue to grow within that ministry. At this time of year, we usually begin to prep uh, the church for what would normally be a mid-year members meeting sometime in August. Uh, that's of course gonna look perhaps a little different this year. We're, we're talking through as elders as to what that might look like. Uh, so stay tuned um, for information about how we might uh, connect with you uh, with a mid-year update on the life of the church. Thanks, Scott. Well, 
As many of us are aware, Friday, Pastor John MacArthur of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California, had made a blog post regarding their church's position on the restrictions and the guidances that the California state government has asked of them. And Tony, I believe the elders sent out an email on Friday with a, just a brief response. I was hoping maybe you can give us a little bit more of an update on that. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, <clears throat> just to be clear, it wasn't the elders that sent out the email. That was me. And, uh, you know, it wasn't based on some long elders discussion. So that was me responding to, you know, getting emails from church members and so forth. So, uh, well, as you know, uh, they posted this position and being that they have some, a large influence, particularly here in the West, uh, and, and church members were reading about it, uh, we needed to let people know that we know what's going on. It's just we need to have some time. Uh, I know we haven't come to any conclusion in terms of moving forward in any different way, just because not all the elders have been back, as I mentioned in that email, Ben, that uh, some were on break. So I can say this, though, because we, those of us who were able to discuss this last night, you know, we can very clearly say that we are grateful and in agreement with the strong, clear biblical position about the relationship between church and state. I don't think we would have any problem with the statement that was placed there. Very sound and biblical. Obviously, you can hold that position and still choose to not meet because they did for four months. So what, what changed? What changed was not their biblical position. You know, they voluntarily agreed to not meet uh, out of the concern for their members' concerns and fears and out of their own concern for the the health safety uh, concerns being shared with them, uh, you know, by the county and by and by the state. So what changed? What changed was their view of the seriousness of COVID-19. Uh, you know, there's, there's no Bible verse to look up here, Ben, to see do we disagree with this verse or that verse. It, it's how do you arrive at a conclusion when you're not an expert in, uh, you know, contagious diseases to 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 de to determine that hey it's okay you don't need to to be fearful but go ahead and come uh, so that's uh, that's a whole new realm obviously you know for us so and I we need more than two clips from Fox News you know we need we need to f decide how we can come to a conclusion about that and we need to talk about that together as elders and and lastly I know that in a conversation uh, with some uh, after the Sunday service and you know not everyone from their church came and they had to clarify with their own members that okay uh, if you decide not to come because of health concerns uh, you're not sinning uh, but if you decide not to come out of uh, concern for uh, disobeying the state we think you are sinning now so in other words they had to deal with this in their own internal uh, application of this and we just need time to, to catch up with that obviously we all want to meet uh, and as I said in my quick email I have no agenda uh, it would just feel the weight we collectively feel the weight of making a decision that could possibly affect the physical health of people we love in a negative way oh, yeah. while we also know their spiritual health is suffering because we aren't able to put our arms around them meet with them get close yeah. to you yeah so that's 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 really difficult but we just need more time with us so appreciate your prayers and last you know what there is good news on the front of getting together uh, albeit not in our own facility you know ben you've been in conversations with uh fair oaks baptist church in concord whom we've we've helped out uh, through this time as well and they're offering us an opportunity to meet outdoors uh, once you once you share that, because you've been in touch with them, not me. Well, Tony, as you mentioned, I and Chris Kieskinen have been talking with the folks over at Fair Oaks about using their courtyard and their parking lot for meeting outdoors. And, uh, well, praise the Lord, they've actually uh, opened up their courtyard and their parking lot to us so that we can gather. We can use our own PA system. We can use their restrooms. And, and frankly, we can all gather together on Sunday evenings, which is really super exciting. Ben, a question, just so administratively, you feel like there's no challenge we face there. The goal is simply now uh, to try and work this up so we could even meet this Sunday in a very casual sort of format, you know, sing together, uh, 
pray together and maybe have a, a, a briefer devotional or something of that nature. Administratively, think we can get this all done by this Sunday then so we could sometime later this week post a time and, uh, and location and so forth? Tony, that's a great, uh, great question. Yes, administratively, there's really not going to be much difficulty. What we're going to ask for everybody to do is for everybody to sign up. Now, it's not because we're trying to limit anything, but what that does is that gives us essentially names and emails and phone numbers should we need to make any adjustments or anything like that. It also allows us to send out things like bulletin uh, information or lyrics so that if you're there participating, uh, we can't project and we're probably not gonna be printing out our, you know, all of the large lyrics. I mean, if you don't have a phone or anything like that, then obviously we'll have a few on hand. But for the most part, it just allows us administratively when you sign up to know how many people are gonna be there. Um, also, yeah, it can happen this next Sunday. That's exciting. And I really would encourage you, once we get those links out, go ahead and sign up. I'm also going to have a little video available so that if you're not sure how do I sign up for this, we'll, we'll, we'll be guiding you all the way through that. Thanks, Ben. That's really good news. So, folks, you heard it that uh, they've opened their hearts to us. We have an opportunity to meet outdoors for worship and song and prayer and, and hearing the word. Uh, we'll get logistics to you later on. But there's also uh, some good news on a smaller front uh, earlier I asked Scott to, to look into the, uh, the county's description and detailed understanding of the social bubbles and whether or not at this point there's just more we can be doing and encouraging uh, people to get together because we realize people need to spend time together even in a sm uh, in smaller context. So Scott, you, you spoke with them directly a couple times. Why don't you tell us what you've learned there and what you think we could be looking forward to? Yeah, thanks, Tony. I, I guess I'd start by saying, you know, as pastors, we recognize that the importance of fellowship and mutual encouragement is just vital to people's spiritual growth and health in the Lord. Um, I think when church reopened and people were able to gather again, that really encouraged us. And we thought that really this would be a, a way, as we worshiped together, would be a way, if not the way, that we would finally be able to pour into one another uh, through through being together, worshiping together, encouraging one another. Well, when that got shut down uh, again, uh, we sought to reach out to find other ways that we might be more serious about seeking to find ways to get the church plugged into smaller group gatherings since we can't meet any longer in a larger group. And so I reached out to the county uh, on a few occasions over the last few days. And um, what I learned First of all, I found on their website, uh, even their own acknowledgement uh, to the question, how can I safely gather? And one of the first st statements in that website was their recognition that meeting with family and friends is vital to someone's mental and physical health. And we would say, yes, amen, and it's vital to their spiritual health as well. And so as I, as I, scanned through that website and saw how they laid out guidelines and recommendations for how people might safely gather. I then called the county to just sort of get a, a clearer understanding of what the county was recommending, laying out, were there restrictions or limitations that they were proposing. And what I learned was they, as they recognized that meeting with family and friends is important, they do lay out um, what they call a, a description for social bubbles and about how people might safely gather in small numbers. And you can go to the website, we can provide you the link there and they lay out what those limits, not what those limitations are, because I asked if these were limitations and they said they were, they were not limitations, they were really guidelines and suggestions that they had put together and the state has put together about seeking to find ways to minimize the spread of, 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 of the virus. And, and the suggestions are 12 people, outdoors, social distancing. Uh, and they, even within their description, they said, if you choose to go indoors, wear face masks, social distance, sanitize. And so they, so knowing that, and in our conscience, uh, we feel there is, that we want to really seek to encourage you, if, as you're comfortable, to find ways with those who are closest to you, perhaps some of you, or, or perhaps even doing that now already, um, but in a small group with those you're comfortable with and those you're close with, maybe some of them are in your community group, that you find ways to gather 
in your backyards where you can pray for one another, encourage one another, build one another up. Uh, we just think that, that now is the time to seek to try to encourage you all following safe protocols that the county has established to um, engage one another, uh, not just through this kind of medium like we're doing here, but it's, there's something special about being next to somebody and, and watch and looking into their eyeballs, not through a video screen, but uh, just from a few feet away. And uh, there's something about hearing someone's voice in your backyard, sitting in, the same, in a lawn chair near you, that just is an encouragement uh, to you uh, to see people, right? We're social people, relational people. And we just think it's time to seek to encourage the body to, for some of you, you may have felt like it's not something you can do. But we're here to tell you that it's something you can do. Okay, so Scott, on that. So Scott, on that, um, I've got a community group, and uh, is it are you are you saying that it's okay for my community group, which is at this moment less than twelve people, that if we have a, if we find if one of our homes has a backyard that we're okay to meet in it, um, if if we want to meet inside, it's it's actually okay for us to meet inside and to fellowship. Yeah, Ben, that's that's a good good clarification. You know, I asked that very question, and on their website, they will first of all they say if you choose to meet indoors, right? So their their recommendation is you do it outdoors, but then they do say on the website if you choose to meet indoors, follow these certain protocols. You can go to the website and they they spell out how you how you can do that. So so then I asked that very question to be clear, so that they so somehow maybe the website hadn't been updated yet. Um, and ask the question, can people meet indoors if they choose to, based on what you're saying on your website, it appears they can. And the answer to that question was, yes, they can. The preference, again, would be not they meet outdoors where there can be airflow and people can meet under safer conditions. Um, but if you choose to meet indoors, then the recommendation is face mask, sanitizing, et cetera. A thought on this is, uh, and I know in my neighborhood, Scott, people have been meeting in groups, you know, for a while now. I mean, we got this one house down the street. It's a party almost every other Friday night, and they, they do live concerts outside. And, and uh, you know, just that's just the way my neighborhood is, just all around. But I imagine some of us live in neighborhoods where, you know, every Wednesday night, eight cars showing up might be a problem. So I, my own thought is you need to kind of be aware of where you're at and, how your neighbors will look at it at this whole thing what do you think about that scott yeah i think that's a great point um we we've said from the very beginning we want to make sure we are loving our neighbor in this case these are literal neighbors and we want to make sure we do nothing to harm the testimony of christ and so certainly we want to be sensitive to those around us and um in, in terms of how <clears throat> we seek to gather and where we seek to gather and the manner in which we do it so certainly we want to be sensitive to that as well thanks scott yeah so let me just you know, so sum it up to make sure we all understood and heard you clearly. What you discovered is that uh, the guidelines that are being provided are not requirements. You know, what we're being told is these are suggestions. Be mindful, uh, be careful. Here's what we can ask you to consider. People can go to the website and find those guidelines, but we're certainly encouraging small groups to get together and read there what they can about the social bubbles and you know, spend some time in fellowship, folks. Find a way to talk with one another. And I know people will be exercising their own personal conscience on, you know, how safe they feel about that. Uh, and so we're just leaving that with you to, to consider. Lastly, I, I do want to say, Ben, before we finish out this, uh, this part of this podcast, uh, Pastor Cass, is that uh, one of the things I've been working on uh, with the elders is uh, trying to come up with a replacement for our Grace Life conferences. We haven't had that context all year long. And what we've been putting together is uh, Grace Life webinars, for at least for as long as this kind of situation continues. And we thought it'd be good to get some people from outside that uh, do spend a lot of time either writing or speaking on some of the subjects that would be uh, are critical today and be helpful to us, you know, such, such things as the relationship between Christ and culture or what we just talked about, the relationship between Christ and, and the kingdom, you know, uh, meaning uh, a government. 
uh, church and empire, as it's been put before, and uh, also the use of social media. Uh, those are kind of hot topics that would be helpful to have people who think deeply about this and have written for years. So uh, we have the first one we've been working on is with Dr. Michael Haken, who teaches out of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's a, uh, a guest of ours today on this pastor cast. So let's uh, tune in now to a, a brief conversation that I had with him earlier today. Well, hello, everybody. We have as a special guest here today on our pastor cast, Dr. Michael Haken. He is professor of church history and biblical spirituality uh, at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I understand he was born in England of Irish and Kurdish parents. And Michael, you still make your home in Toronto. Is that, is that the case? Yes, uh, we still live in the greater Toronto area. Um, not exactly in Toronto. It's uh, kind of like metro, uh, metropolitan area of New York or LA or any of the big uh, cities. Uh, so we're about 50 miles west of the, uh, the center of the city of Toronto. How long have you been living there? Uh, we've been here since, uh, I've been here since the 60s, uh, the uh, late 60s, when my parents emigrated with myself from the uh, United Kingdom. Wow, okay, so you've made your home there for sure, and yet you, st you, you teach at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, although right now I guess that's a, that's a little challenge. Yeah, the, uh, yeah normally I'd be, uh, you know, obviously commuting every few weeks uh, to do classes there. Uh, but since the COVID uh, pandemic outbreak, uh, you know, we've had lockdown here, and so the border is closed. Yeah. Dr. Haken, how long have you been a theology professor? Uh, I started teaching full-time in 1982, so this will make uh, 38 years of teaching as a church historian. Um, when I got my uh, baccalaureate degree, I went right through, did I master of uh, religion, and then did my PhD immediately following. So I was 28 when I got my PhD. And so very young uh, for that, you know, to be teaching full time at that point. Wow, that's tremendous. I, I didn't realize that. And out of the two subjects, I mean, do you have a favorite? I mean, you, you, you teach church history and biblical spirituality, both at the master's and PhD level? Yeah, I do. Um, most of my teaching is church history. I'm a historian, and when I teach biblical spirituality, it really is the history of biblical spirituality. So I do two courses there. One is, uh, is spirituality in the ancient church, and the other is 18th century evangelical spirituality. So people like Edwards, uh, Andrew Fuller, William Carey, that sort of thing. So my, I'm, yeah, really, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a historian. Well, then I'll, I'll change this. The, that, let me just jump right into this question then. How does church history help the church uh, speak to contemporary issues? In other words, how does that contribute to the discussions that are current? Well, I think it's vital. Um, and I think the, the, some of the recent debates uh, that have been going on in North America, and even with echoes around the world, what has transpired in recent months in uh, the United States has had significant echoes, which is how do we remember the past and how does the past influence us? In this case, the whole issue of racism. But I think that's an excellent illustration of the fact that the past is never simply the past. Uh, history is always with us. It shaped us as who we are. And so for us as Christians, um, we, uh, if we forget the past or we ignore the past, we're really like a person with a degree of dementia. Um, and people with dementia are unable to function properly. Uh, it's a very sad uh, scenario. And I, when I look at the church today, I, I see large sectors of it uh, really functioning like a, a person with dementia. They have, they have no idea where they came from. They have no idea of their roots and which impedes their understanding of who they are. Um, I think church history also, though, uh, can provide us with illustrations of how the church has managed with issues in the past. And um, so about two years ago, uh, during the summer of uh, 2018, there was a brouhaha on the, uh, the internet regarding the doctrine of the Trinity. How do we speak about the relationships between the persons of the Godhead? <clears throat> and some of that discussion I found quite, to be honest, ignorant, because it, it repeated the mistakes of the ancient church. And it, it seemed to me that nobody had, some of the people had not read 
you know, Athanasius, Basil of Caesarea, Augustine. And if they had read them, they wouldn't be making some of the, the, the uh, affirmations that they, they made. And so the past then can help us avoid some of the errors that uh, the, 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 they were committed in the past that get committed again. Um, there's a proverb that a wise person learns from his or her mistakes, a wiser person uh, learns from the mistakes of others, and a fool learns from neither. And to be honest, I, I, the, the, the rejection of thinking about the past or the refusal to think about the past or simple letting the past go uh, puts us in the position of a fool. And uh, so we can learn from the past. And then the, the past has for us a tremendous riches. Um, one thinks of just the, the works of, say, an Augustine or a Calvin or a John Owen. Uh, the, the rich uh, spirituality, the rich theology there. <clears throat> so while it, you, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great point. And it really hits home with me. I don't think you had any way of knowing that my dad currently has Alzheimer's and, and he lives with me. So, uh, no. and the, the past comes in pieces for him. There's chunks missing. And I could see what you're saying applied to theology and practical Christian living. That's, that's tremendous illustration. Uh, let me ask you then what, maybe you could just tell us one point or two points in history that you think uh, would speak to the challenges the church faces today. When, where would you go to? Yeah, I think one of the uh, most illuminating periods would be the period of the 18th century, where uh, it's, a, it's a world in turmoil, the Western world. Um, you have the uh, large uh, cultural revolution called the Industrial Revolution, in which uh, Britain and uh, its colonies in America are being in, going through the Industrial Revolution and being industrialized. The first, the first real nation in the in the world to go through the Industrial Revolution and the turmoil that that caused culturally and economically, but it's also a, a period of uh, massive political turmoil. Um, you have the American Revolution, hard on, hard on the heels of that, you have the uh, French Revolution. And uh, the French Revolution poses a challenge intellectually, which the American Revolution did not, because the Re French Revolution did, was determined to destroy the privilege of the aristocracy. But to do that, it had to basically equalize men and women in terms of their social status. And so it really, it's not Marxism, you know, it'd be anachronistic to call it Marxism, but it has a similar sort of goal as Marxism, which is basically destroy the wealth of the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie. And um, <clears throat> the church then has to, has to deal with this. Uh, in the Anglo-American world, there are significant voices, people like Thomas Paine, um, who was a key figure in the American Revolution, um, supporting elements of the French Revolution, uh, arguing against Christianity, and the church has to respond in the middle of this. Um, it plunges the Anglo-American world into war. Um, in Britain itself, there are frequent outbreaks of riots, uh, the Gordon riots, the Priestley riots, uh, the, the riot known as Peterloo, where about uh, 10,000 people marched on London and the, arm, the government called out the cavalry. Um, uh, who charged into the crowd, about 700 casualties. Um, and uh, in the middle of this, Christians are seeking to <clears throat> respond to these events, uh, seeking to understand how to bear witness, plant churches, and so on. So it's, I think, a very illuminating uh, period. Um, yeah. Very unsettling period. Similar, very similar in some ways to our, our world today. Yeah, I mean, the echoes of what we're seeing today, I could hear them in what, in what you were describing in there. You mentioned Marxism. Now that predated it, as you said, but uh, your experience actually comes out of that. Could you, maybe the last few minutes you take with us, tell us your testimony. You were delivered from Marxism, I understand, by the gospel. Yeah, I was converted in the mid 70s and had been, uh, like many of my generation, um, uh, influenced deeply by uh, neo-Marxism or the kind of Marxist uh, left during the late 60s, early 70s. So uh, I, I was never a member of any sort of formal organization, but I would have been a committed, uh, committed to violent revolution, uh, the sort of Che Guevara 
<clears throat> uh, style. Uh, his book on guerrilla warfare was a book I read. I read Mousy Tongue. I was, my heroes were people like the Black Panthers, Eldridge Cleaver, Huey Newton, uh, the SDS, Students for the Democratic Society, the Weathermen. Um, and um, uh, very committed to the destruction of uh, the bourgeoisie in my, what I thought of it. Um, and uh, so I understand to some degree the sort of thinking that uh, informs certain groups today um, in terms of their ideology. And then the gospel came to you, I understand, through your wife, although she wasn't your wife at the time, if, uh, if that's how the story goes. And so at what point did you come to faith in, in Christ? Yes. Um, and I, I, I think the thing that God used uh, was uh, the whole concept of death and the realization that Marxism had no answer, had absolutely no answer uh, for life after death. And so, again, like many in my generation, I began to search in terms of spirituality, uh, dabbled in uh, Eastern spirituality. Again, like many, you know, I think of uh, George Harrison and the Beatles and the whole thing with the Mah Mah Mahesh Maharishi Yogi. And so I got into Transcendental Meditations and Buddhism. And then in God's providence, I, I met the woman who became my wife, Allison, um, and we were working in a pizza parlor and she was the cashier. I was a pizza maker and I found out she went to church and I thought I had been raised Roman Catholic, you know, Irish Catholic. And I thought I, I got, I got to clean up some things in my life. I thought, so I asked her if I could go to church with her and I had really never heard the gospel. And uh, so it was that in the spring of 1974, I was converted uh, to Christ and sensed a call to vocational ministry, uh, started seminary that fall, um, and uh, probably was too young uh, to go to seminary, I think, in some ways, uh, certainly spiritually, uh, but uh, in the providence of God, uh, went to seminary in the fall of 1974. Wow, brother, what a, what a great story of the, the power of God's grace uh, delivering us from hopeless ideologies that we are blind to until they open our eyes. Thank you so much. As you know, we've been talking about trying to set up some sort of webinar. Our hope is to replace some of our conferences that we've missed this year as a, as a congregation. And uh, you and I connected. The hope is to reflect on some elements of uh, moments of church history to help us think clearly about today's uh, challenges. So we look forward to trying to arrange some of that here in the near future. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, My Dr. Pleasure. Aiken. Thank you. Taking this time with us. Lord bless you. God bless. Thank you. Well, Tony, thank you very much for all of that. And uh, we're looking forward to future information about when that webinar is going to be. Well, family, uh, that's about it for our pastor cast for today. And that's Wednesday, July 29th. Uh, again, let us know how, how this pastor cast resonated with you. Uh, feel free to send me an email if you'd like. You can see my email listed below the screen. If you need to get uh, in contact with uh, Grace Bible Church, please feel free to give us a phone call. If you have any needs, we'd love to be able to reach out and meet those. Uh, but until then, family, we will look forward to either seeing you together, uh, Lord willing, Sunday evening, or just via the, uh, the streaming uh, of our services. So until then, may the Lord bless you. God bless you. Love you. Miss you. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, we love you, flock. Uh, we are missing you. We are praying for you. Please pray for us. There's a lot uh, to be thinking about.